the perfect introduction. <laughs> it's nice to be among friends. Thanks for having me. My name is Barton Bean. I sometimes introduce myself as my name is Bart and I'm an alcoholic because it's an important part of the new beginnings in my life. I, uh, I was born a Unitarian um, with two parents who graduated number, number one and number two in their class at Swarthmore College which is a good Quaker school, and uh, whose motto, by the way, is mind the light, which I like. Um, so uh, needless to say, I was brought up with intelligent people in my life, but they had the emotional capacity of a turnip. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, and it was a long time until I began to discover that I had, uh, you know, any, any emotions that could be uh, either enjoyed or or not enjoyed. I, uh, being born a Unitarian, I, I grew up understanding a lot about religions, but not having a lot of boundaries in my own life, and I sort of struggled for a while. I realized that I've come by my addictions and my insanity uh, by having a famous great-grandfather ictheologist who when he, just, he, he, he couldn't remember the name of a, of a fish and where it was located, took out his false teeth and his glasses and he put them on the railing of the bridge that he dove over to kill himself. Um, a grandfather who uh, went, was a patent attorney who lost his first case and went out into the attic and drank himself to death. And a mother with manic depression. So I come by my insanity and alcoholism on the natch. Okay, I didn't, I, didn't have, I didn't have any choice in it any more than I had any choice where I was born or who I was born to. You know, I, I often get into arguments with myself about whether or not there's such a thing as free will. I, I didn't pick any of that, okay? I didn't, I didn't choose where I was born. I remember going into Tijuana the first time I ever drove into Tijuana, and I got down on the knee, my knees in my car, and I said, thank you, Mom and Dad, for not having me in Tijuana. You know, not that they're not lovely people born in Tijuana, but I'm just grateful I was born in Ithaca, New York. Um, I started drinking my grandfather's whiskey when I was 12. And uh, I did it because I, I did it because I did it. Uh, it, it. It answered something in me. It, made me. it gave me this warm sense of belonging that I, uh, that I had not felt before. I'd always, I, was, I was always different because I was always smarter than the other kids in school, that kind of thing. I, you know, we were Unitarians, you know, at one place I went to in the high school, they had, remember, Unitarians are heathen up on the wall of their church, you know, and, and so I had to deal with not being like anybody else or belonging anywhere. Um, we moved to Painesville, Ohio. Painesville, Ohio, just get the name for just a second. <laughs> And you'll, realize, and you'll realize why I ran away from home when I was 14 and went to live with my grandmother and uncle in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and I thought, I was, I thought that that's was where the answer was going to be. Unfortunately, it, it, it's no more an answer than anywhere else. Uh, but I had, a, you know, I had a suicide attempt because I thought I could not go forward or go backward. And uh, I remember in the middle of it, I had drunk everything in the house, and I'd, I'd had all of the pills, and, and uh, uh, my, my ears still ring, by the way, just so you know. But, uh, um, but I realized that I would never see a flower again. And, uh, and it was one of those moments that really changed my life, because all of a sudden I realized that, that that'd be a terrible thing to lose. And it wasn't so much about people. It has come to be about people, but it wasn't then. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I went to college in Brooklyn because in Brooklyn you can uh, drink at 18. Or you could at, at that time. You could drink at 18 and I was 18 and I thought this would be a great thing. I can go, I can drink. And I found Rose's Bar and Grill. And Rose's Bar and Grill was a bar where they closed at 5.30 to 6 to sweep up the sawdust and reopen. And I loved it because I felt at home. I could drink whatever I wanted to drink. Nobody would bother me. Nobody would ask me any questions. So essentially, I'm a Skid Row alcoholic because that's where I'm most comfortable, okay? I didn't want to acknowledge that for the longest time. I didn't even know it. I, didn't, I had no idea was, I was an alcoholic. I didn't even know what one was. What one was. Um, so I, I, needless to say, they did not ask me. I went through three roommates to get one that drank like I did. 
needless to say, they did not ask me back to Long Island University. So I went up to the family place up in Cape Cod, and unfortunately, my uncle and aunt were there. And my uncle, who was a very wise man, said, why don't you, well, since you're not going back to college, why don't you take care of your military obligation? It was come some kind of like Zen koan thing, and, I, and before I knew it, I was in Buzzards Bay, and I was, I was uh, signing up to go in the military. It never dawned on me that I never had a military obligation until he said it. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I, so I, I, I went to the Coast Guard because I liked boats and I thought I could be near home, and they said, well, you can't be in the Coast Guard because you wear glasses. And I went, oh, okay. So the next door down, thank God, was the Navy. I'm glad it wasn't the Marines because I was stupid enough I probably would have joined them. But the next door down was the Navy, and they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a journalist. I, want to, I like to write. I was, right, I was the editor of my literary magazine in high school. Uh, and they said, well, do you, can you type 40 words a minute? I said, no. And they said, well, you can't do that. What else do you like? I said, well, I like people. And they said, why don't you become a corpsman? And I went, what's a corpsman? And they said, well, it's like a medic, only it's in the Navy. I said, OK, that sounds good. Let's do that. You know, like many of our lives, I don't know about the rest of you, I, I've always envied those people who knew what they wanted to do from the time they were born. I've never known what I wanted to do, okay? So I just, and I, and I said, okay, great, I'll become a corpsman. So um, <laughs> as a result of that, I, uh, I was in the hospital at Great Lakes during training, and I saw somebody with a green uniform that had green pajamas on and green shoes, you know, sneakers, and I went, I, I hate uniforms, so I went, what do you, I'm a Unitarian, of course I'd hate uniforms. I looked, I said, what do you do? How do I get to have, wear green pajamas like that? And they said, well, I work in the operating room. I said, okay. So I went to school to learn to work in the operating room, okay? And I'm in Bethesda, Maryland, and I'm learning how to be in, uh, in the, I'm drinking from, I don't know, whenever I got off work till 2 o'clock in the morning, getting back up at 6.30. I could do that then. I can hardly get downstairs now. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, but when, when, what happened was that it, when they asked me where I wanted to go after the school, I said Japan. So they sent me to Bethesda, or to Bainbridge, Maryland, where they will start the enema in this country. Okay, so I was in Bethesda, Mar in Bainbridge, Maryland, and Vietnam came along and I said, I think I better volunteer. I wanted some action. I wanted to get out of the country. I wanted to do something. And I thought, well, I had a plan, and my plan was very simple. We, I, had, I knew John Wayne. I knew we were Americans. I knew that they were excuse the expression, the term at the time was gooks, okay? So I had no perception of what was going on. So I signed up, I said, I'll go to Vietnam. So in 1965, I went to Vietnam. I went through Camp Pendleton first on my way to Vietnam, where I learned how to carry a 50 pound pack on the back of my thing and run over mountains. It was horrible. Um, so, I, so, I, so, I'm, so I'm in, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to Vietnam, I get there, and I'm working in a hospital, and the hospital, the night before our hospital was supposed to be open, the Viet Cong come and blow up the laboratory operating room and x-ray department, and they run across the street and blew up 21 helicopters, and all of a sudden I went, I'll be lucky to get out of here alive, right? Well, what happened was that happens so often. I am dragged into compassion and into the new beginnings that that compassion brings if I am willing, if I'm, if I'm available, if I'm open to that, if I'm present for it. So I wound up working in a Vietnamese hospital, the surgical hospital for the city and county of Da Nang. Uh, and, and I gotta tell you, of the seven guys that went with me, the six other guys that went with me, four of us didn't, didn't eat for a week and the other, the other three threw up immediately. I mean, it was, um, when I realized, first of all, because I spoke a little French, I realized that everybody there had been at war for 30 years. And that hit me with such intensity. I went, oh my God, how could, they? everybody had lost a family member. And I realized I had, I had never heard of that happening. I, you know, I'm from Painesville, Ohio, for Christ's sakes. I, you know, I, my world is very insular and small. And all of a sudden, you're telling me that you've been at war for 30 years. So my heart just began to open up in ways that it never would have happened otherwise. I'm, I'm so grateful I went to Vietnam because my heart is bigger as a result of it, okay? Un unbeknown, I, didn't, I didn't choose it, but it, it happened that way. Um, so after... after you know, um, one of the things that happened there as a result, and I think I know why, but it's kind of weird. 
after, after eight months, I'm getting orders, and, and everybody else is not getting orders, and they leave at 13 months, and I'm all by myself. They all take off on a bus, and I'm there for another six months, eight months, whatever it was. And I started getting this attitude, and all of a sudden, I'm, all of a sudden I'm, I'm getting ready to, I'm in the middle of the night, and I'm in my green uniform with my sneakers on, and, and there's a medevac that has to go out, and I've got about three months left in the Navy, and, and I got on this helicopter, and I go to get gas, and it's pitch dark, and there's no place in the world as dark as Vietnam. Oh, that's it. Thank you very much. No. Um, <laughs> one more minute. Okay. Um, so so what, what happened was um, another moment that changed my life where I, I, I had compassion, and as a result of that, a new beginning. I saw this. I, I saw how other people had to live their life every day in this war, and I, I, I was just one of them. Uh, it was an interesting experience, but I, let me, I didn't realize I was gonna talk this long. Um, for me, new beginnings are based on the fact that I'm present wherever I'm going. What I look for in this new year is the opportunity to be compassionate, and as a result of that, have my life change because I'm present and available. To me, that's the most important thing I can bring to that. Sorry to take so long. Thanks for letting me share. I am role modeling openness when I share with you that I'm a bit of a last minute substitute for the younger Cherish Jones, who has out of town family visiting. If it helps any, Cherish, although an adult, told me she wants to be like me when she grows up. She thinks I'm grown up. <laughs> Don't tell. New beginnings. It took a while for me to process that topic to determine if it's redundant. Then I remembered I wrote an essay years ago entitled The Road Back to Begin about my inner child and taking my hand and guiding me toward enlightenment. retracing my life, my ancestral guides, my fears, my joys. I'm still not enlightened, just ask my therapist, but I'm deeply aware of new beginnings. At my age, I've been privileged to experience many, often by being dragged, again, kicking and screaming. Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu wrote that new beginnings often are disguised as painful endings. I see them sometimes as tiny incremental shifts in perspective, other times seismic and profound adjustments, transcending transformations. New beginnings, the priceless moment of exuberance and relief when my late Navy lieutenant husband returned from Vietnam. I will not forget his phone call telling me he was back in the US. I turned to my sister while sobbing, he's safe. We had a new journey. Painful endings, new beginnings. When our oldest son was a teenager, he began the distressing descent into the grip of addiction. And like him, I often yearned for oblivion. Not to feel, not to visit him in jail on Christmas Day, not to codependently and desperately try to fix him, to fix me, to fix us, not to watch him suffer, not to experience our broken family, the many rehabs, and yet, out of that, dawned a new beginning, his beautiful, difficult, courageous recovery. I've learned so much from him about love and letting go and resilience and hard work. I returned to college to study, to learn about addiction, to help other teenagers when I couldn't reach my own son. I ended up with an enormously satisfying career as a certified substance abuse therapist working at an adolescent residential treatment center doing individual group and family therapy. Our younger son, who, whose role was to be the easy child <laughs> and make us laugh, could now relax and make some mistakes himself, which he did. However, his new beginning involved receiving his master's in psychology, 
and because it seems we need all the understanding we can get. And humor, dark and otherwise, has kept our family relatively sane and communicative. New beginnings. When my husband and I retired relatively young, in our 50s, we made a mutual decision to follow our dream and leave the rather suffocating and generally conservative Midwest and gray skies and snow and live the rest of our lives in California. To gaze at the ocean and the endless horizon, to grasp hope, to leave behind some devastatingly sad memories and basically breathe again. Painful endings, new beginnings. We sold our home, gave away most all of our belongings, said goodbye to family and friends, climbed into our bright red Miata convertible <laughs> and our belongings and sang California, here we come. And we've never looked back for 20 years. 12 years ago as a guest speaker here at Tapestry, I talked about reflective transcending moments and one of them described the HBO series, The Corner, a realistic, gritty story of life on the streets based on real people. And one of the central characters is an educated man who loves books and through a series of misfortunes, questionable choices and heredity, he has struggled for years, descending into the depths of addiction, poverty, depression, bleakness. In a very haunting, evocative, simple scene though, we see a person moving from his physicality to a sense of spirituality. He becomes one with the universe for a brief, shining moment in time. He begins the day with hope, he is sober, and he has a few dollars in his pocket. For right now, he is not overwhelmed by the situation. We watch him walk to the harbor, a book in hand, taking the time to absorb, literally and figuratively, the sunshine of the day. Breathing deeply, he begins to open his heart to what is good, allowing unguarded moments, connecting each sense. This nostalgic taste of a sandwich he slowly savors, the fresh smell of the ocean, the caressing sound and rhythm of the waves, the warm and tactile comfort of the sandy beach, the kindness of friendly chatter and communion with seagulls. He gazes at the horizon of possibilities, mind and body at ease, belonging to the earth and connecting with humanity. He loses it, or as it finds himself in the normalcy of what most of us might consider a routine day. It's a transcending moment. Painful mem memories and events reframing as new beginnings. Once again, feeling connected to the universe, to humanity, and open to creative forces that renew our spirit. As you and I share our stories in this safe place, we are building mutual valuing, connecting threads, of our tapestry and renewing our spirit for the new year. Namaste.